Hi everyone, I just want to welcome all of you to today's webinar. Uh, today's training will be on the basics of setting up Desk.com and we'll be showing you the essentials that you'll need to get started with Desk. Everything from setting up users and groups to setting up your email. Now, this is part one of five of our webinar series for this month. And if you haven't already, go ahead and visit the registration page for the remaining webinar sessions, uh, where we'll be looking at some other advanced admin features and as well as the essentials for your agent users. Uh, so uh, my name is Brian Sub. I'm the onboarding and training specialist here at Desk. And I have here with me my colleague, Bob, who is a technical support senior engineer here at Desk. And we'll be hearing from him in just a few moments here. Uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, following our actual training session will be a short Q&A, so please feel free to type your questions into the GoToWebinar questions panel, and we'll do our best to get them answered towards then. Now, our session today will be also recorded, so if you can't stay with us for the entire time, we'll be emailing the recording within 24 hours, and we'll also be posting the video to our YouTube channel, so watch out for that. So without further ado, uh, let's dive into Desk and get a first-hand look into Desk.com uh, and the setup. Uh, so I'll go ahead and hand over to you, Bob. Uh, before we begin, Bob, can you give a brief introduction uh, of yourself? Hi, my name is Bob Aloisio. I've been with Desk for three and a half years, and I'm the level three escalation point for our customer WOW team. We're the support team for Desk, and we'll handle any questions that you might have regarding Desk and how to use it. Uh, this, the demonstration I'm going to do is going to explain how to create a startup workflow for your site. We're going to use two mailboxes and create this workflow using the agent, groups, mailboxes, labels, rules, and filters. Let's get started. Company name is, so this part here, .desk.com slash home. Once you get there, you're going to get this um, screen here. This is basically your launch screen. And you can pick whether you're going into the agent, into business insights, which is our reporting tool, or into the admin. In this case, we're just going to go right into the admin. So you log in with your email address. That's your username and your password. And it's going to bring you to the admin screen that you see here. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to create agents. Now, you probably, you probably know what this is, but agents are the reps that you're going to have working in your company that are going to be responding to your customers' cases. Your agents can either be full-time or flex agents. That's going to be up to you. In this example, the agents will be full-time agents. So let's go create an agent. What you do is you go to Team and then users, and as you can see, I already have five agents created here. I'm going to create another agent. This agent's name is going to be Scott. I'm going to give him his email at my fictitious company. And I'm going to give him a name that the outside world will see him as. So you don't have to use their real name. I'm just going to give him a fake name. You can put in a signature so that in the event that you, you know, Scott responds to a customer, it'll automatically pre-fill his signature so he doesn't need to do it every time. You can set his access level. So the access levels are basically the lowest being the agent and the highest being the billing administrator. And in between you have these different steps that have different levels of permission on what they can and can't do in the agent and admin. But for our purposes, we're going to use him as an agent. And then we have this group section. We'll get to that in a few minutes because we're going to create some groups and then we're going to add the agents to the groups. So that's really all there is to creating a full-time agent. So you click add and what will happen is Scott will get a uh, an email an automated email from the system saying an agent account's been created for you and then click on the verify link to log in. And he'll be able to set his own password. Just be sure that the email address that you're putting in here 
is typed correctly, this is their login. So if they need to do something like a password reset or get that initial registration email, this, this email address needs to be correct. So we have our six agents created, and now we're just going to go create a group. What groups are, are are groups of agents that will handle certain types of cases. So in our example, we're going to use sales and support as our two main groups. So we're going to have sales cases, and we're going to have support cases. We're also going to add an escalations group. So we're just going to call this group escalations or escalated, and we're going to add the managers of each team to that group. So myself, Caesar, and Mike are now part of that group. And if you look here, we have our group created. So any escalated cases will go to Bob, Caesar, or Mike, and they'll be able to see them. So additionally, as, as I mentioned earlier, there was that, um, that group section in the agent we're going to add the sales agents to the group, and we're going to add the support agents to the group. Agents can cross different groups. So as you can see here, Bob, Mike, uh, I'm sorry, Mike is, a, is in the sales group. He's the manager of the sales group, and Bob and Caesar are in the support group, and they manage the support group. They are also in the escalations group, so the users can cross into different groups. So now we've set up our, our team, our users, and our groups, and now we want to take a look at our mailboxes. We want to set up some mailboxes to receive email. So what you would do is you would go to channels, email, and then inbound mail. By default, we create a postmark mailbox for you. It's got an email address of support at your company dot desk dash mail dot com. There are ways to change this down the road, but that's going to be in a more advanced webinar that we go over at a later date. So for now, we're going to use this as our support email address. In addition to the postmark address, you can also use your own mailbox, which is would be in a, a Gmail box or an Exchange server or uh, you know any you know, Office 365, any third party that supports IMAP. So you can either connect to your existing mailbox or you can use the postmark address and either use it directly or have emails forwarded to this address. In our example, we're going to use the support address here to co collect our support emails, and we're going to add a Gmail box for our sales emails. So I'm just going to call this my sales mailbox. And I've created a sales mailbox already on Gmail. And you just plug in your password. So it's the name. The the name is whatever you want to know it as. It's not uh, required to be anything specifically. Your email address and your password. And then you click continue. And you get this screen here when you success, successfully create your mailbox. You do have the option to import existing emails if they're already on the server. But in our case, we're not. I'm just going to say I'm done. And as you can see, our mailbox is created. So if you look at each mailbox, when you go into your mailbox, there, there are some settings in there. And you're going to see that the postmark mailbox looks a little different than the Gmail box. There are some advanced settings down here inbound address filters and outbound address filters that you don't need to worry about yet for your initial setup. This is a more advanced functionality that will be covered at a later time. 
in this case though, you can set the default group on the mailbox to be the group that you want these emails to go to. So if you remember, we created agents that were assigned to the support group. This is where you assign the cases to that group. So the default group is now the support group on this mailbox. So you set it and then you hit update. If you look at the Gmail box that we had, you have some more advanced settings like I said. And these are just these are automatically pre-filled when you connect your Gmail box. There are some other advanced settings as well here that you can change and manipulate. Uh, again, we'll go over that at a later time. Uh, but for getting yourself started, you just set the default group, update the mailbox, and now anything that comes into support is going to go to the support group. Anything that comes into sales is going to go to the sales group. One other thing to note, in the outbound mailboxes, when you create an inbound mailbox, the outbound mailbox that matches it is already automatically created for you. So you don't have to worry about creating a new one. So as you can see, the settings here are similar. You don't really have to play with them unless you need to change something or manipulate it, but the outbound mailboxes are created for you. So if you remember, we created three groups. We created the support group, the sales group, and the escalations group. However, I only have two mailboxes. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a label for the escalations team. And what a label is, is a, um, is a way to categorize your cases. So basically, if you look here, these are some examples that we provide for you out of the box. You can delete them, or you can modify them, or you can create new ones. I'm going to create one called escalation. This is going to note my cases that need to be escalated to a manager. I'm going to make it red. And you can just leave these settings alone. You don't really need to touch them. And you just need to make it active. And add it. So as you can see, any cases that have the escalation label will have a red label called escalation. Later on, when we go over the actual cases, we're going to do some escalations. And you'll see how that works. So we've created our groups, we've created our agents, we've created our label, we've created our mailboxes, both inbound and outbound. The next thing we need to do is we need to create a filter. So what a filter is, is a place where you can see all the cases that a certain cer set of search criteria, when they're met, they'll show up in these filters. So if you look at um, filters, out of the box we give you 10 sample filters. We only turn a couple of them on. You can look at each one and determine what it does. Generally speaking, I like to start with just these three turned on. So I'm going to take the outbox filter and I'm going to move it up the list. So out of, by default, I like to start out with my cases. If you look at what's in my cases, you have status less than or equal to pending, and assigned user is current user. So basically what that means is any cases that are less than or equal to pending and assigned to the current user that's looking at the filter will show in this filter. So the cool thing is this filter is going to be different for everybody. Everybody's only going to see their own cases because they're set to current user. If I wanted to only see Bob's cases, I could just set it to Bob and I would everybody would see Bob's cases. But for my cases, we want to leave it at current user. There's a couple of other things that we want to go over when we're looking at filters. The first one is the all condition versus the any condition. So you're probably going to come across this in your, you know, pretty pretty frequently when you're creating filters and rules, what's the difference between an all and an any condition? The easiest and simplest way I can use to describe it is to say out loud to yourself, the case must meet all of these conditions. So in this case, the case has to meet 
all of these conditions, status less than or equal to pending, and assigned user is current user. For the any condition, I'd suggest that you read the statement to yourself out loud as well. The case can meet any of these conditions. So it's basically a big or statement. So um, with, with an any condition, you can, you can have multiple criteria in there. So you can, you can also mix and match. You can have all conditions and any conditions in the same uh, filter if you need to. The other thing that you want to know is this, uh, this operator field here. This is the uh, status is less than or equal to, to pending. You have different op search operators here, and you can, you can use them to, to determine what statuses of cases will show up in this filter. So when it comes to statuses, the lowest status is new, and the highest status is deleted. So when you're looking at the less than or equal condition, they start out at new, the next one up is open, the next one is pending, and then it goes to resolved, closed, and deleted. So anything less than or equal to pending would be new, open, and pending cases. So you're encompassing all three of them in one, one search operator here. You have some sorting options and grouping options. I'm not really going to get into that. They're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the other thing that's that you want to note is that you can set the group on a filter. So you can set who sees the filter. So if you only want your cases shown to the sales group, you'd select the sales group. If you only want them shown to the support group, you would show them to the support group. So what I'm going to do here for the example is I'm going to create three filters. The first one is going to be my support cases. You don't need to fill in the description, but you can. I generally try to stay away from using keywords unless I absolutely have to, so I'm not really going to get into what they are. You can find out the definitions of the keywords here in the search article. So my condition is going to be status less than or equal to pending and the assigned group is support. I only want my support agents to see it, so I'm going to set it to the support group. And then I'm going to enable the rule. I'm sorry, I'm going to enable the filter. I'm going to do the same thing for the sales cases. As you can see, I'm using the status as less than or equal to pending. That's probably the most commonly used um, status condition that we find. And I'm going to assign this to the sales group. I'm going to enable it, and I'm going to update it. And then I am going to add an escalations group. So what I'm going to do here is going to be a little different. I'm going to mix and match with the all and the any condition. So I'm going to have my status condition be the same. These are going to be my active escalated cases. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an any condition. So for all cases that are new, open, or pending and contain the label escalated, escalation that I created earlier, or they contain the group escalated that we created earlier. So the way that's read is status is less than or equal to pending, so status new, open, or pending, and either the label contains escalation or the group is escalated. And we're going to use that 
later on. I'm going to set it so only the managers see it, and I'm going to update the case, update the filter. So the other thing you can do is you can move these up and down the list. So as you see, you have this number here. You can either show them as the first one in the list, or you can drag it up and down the list. like this. And these ones that are grayed out aren't going to be displayed. So basically only the agents that have access to these filters will see them and they'll see them in this order. So the last part of our workflow is going to be to create some rules to set the outbound mailbox to match the inbound. Now if you remember we had these outbound mailboxes but you need to know how to select which one is going to be the right one for each group. So the way we do that is we use an outbound rule. We're going to add the rule and we're going to set the mailbox. So for email cases, I want to set my outbound mailbox to the sales mailbox. And the way we're going to do that is to say if the case assigned group is the sales group, and then we're going to take an action on it. Unlike filters, filters are just searches for cases. With rules, you can actually take action. So we're going to set the mailbox to be the sales mailbox. You can choose when you want to run this rule. I generally use any time for most of the case, most of the time, but you know, for weekends and nights and stuff like that, you can choose during business hours or non-business hours or as to when to run a rule. It's really up to you. And then you enable the rule. So I'm going to do the same thing for the support mailbox, but I'm going to use this little copy button here. And what this does is it allows me to copy this rule and then I can modify it after the fact. So as you can see, it created a copy. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the outbound mailbox to be the support mailbox. We're going to change the condition of the rule to be case assigned group is support. And we're going to set the mailbox to be the support mailbox. We're going to run it anytime and enable the rule and then update it. So that's it. We've built our workflow. So now what will happen, based on what we've done, is cases that come in will get assigned to the correct group, either sales or support, based on the mailbox that they come into. And when the agent responds to them, they'll go out of the right mailbox. Additionally, only the agents that belong to those groups will see those cases. So let's see this in action in the, in the agent. So what I've done is I've gone up here to the upper left of the screen, pulled down the little drop down, pulled down next gen agent, which is the agent screen. And as you can see, Bob Aloisio was the uh, was the sales. I'm also the customer on this, so that might be a little bit confusing. But um, the agent account that I'm logged in with, Bob, is a support rep, and he's also the support manager. So he sees the support cases for his team. He also sees the escalation queue. He also sees his cases, which right now he doesn't have any assigned to him. You can see all the cases that are in the queue. And you can see the outbox. I'm also going to bring up, just so you can see the difference, Problem 
Hang on, having some technical difficulties. I'm going to switch over to another screen so that you can see what I'm trying to show you. And then I'll come back. So if you look here now, I'm logged in as one of my other agents. And this is my sales agent. This is Mike. And as you can see, Mike only sees the sales cases. He does not see the support cases. He still sees the escalation queue because he was the manager of the sales team. And he sees all the other filters being the same, but he does not see the support cases. And then we have Caesar, who was also similar to Bob. He was in the support group. He's in the escalations team, and he sees all of his cases here. So I'm going to switch back to my other screen now. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to respond to the cases. So I'm going to assign this case to Bob. update it and as you can see it'll go into my my cases filter I'm also going to respond to another case and as you can see this case came into the Gmail box but it was assigned to the support group and I did that prior to the case prior to the training I assigned this manually to the support team so as you can see you can change the group assignment on the cases you can change the agent assignment and you can escalate so what I'm going to do here is even though this one says it's going from sales at gmail.com I'm going to send it because I'm in the support group and what's going to happen As you can see, this went out of the support mailbox, even though it was transferred from the sales mailbox. So it can be a little bit confusing that you're going to see that mailbox there, but you can either pull it down and pull, pick it, or in case the agent forgets, when they send it, the rule will do it for them. So. As you can see, I transferred that case before it went into my cases, and now this case is in my cases. This how do I delete user's case? So the last thing we're going to do is we're going to escalate this to a manager. So when this customer sends in a case, says one of your reps was rude to me and needs to be fired. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set the escalation on this. I'm going to add a note. and update the case and that'll go into the into the escalated team. Additionally, I'm looking at the all cases filter and I see this case in here even though it's in the sales group but I want to escalate it to a manager because it needs to get immediate attention. So instead of setting the group I could also set the label. So it's still in the sales group, but it's escalated to a manager. And I'm going to do the same thing. So as you can see, the first thing you're going to see here is when you add the label to it for the escalated group, it's got the bright red escalation uh, bubble so that you know everybody knows it's a high priority but the second thing we're going to see now is in the escalations group because we use that any condition even though the case is assigned to sales it's got the escalation label on it and it's assigned to this filter as well as this case which is in the escalated group doesn't have the label but it's still in the filter so they're both correct because we use that any condition which was the label contains escalation 
or the uh, group is escalated. So that's it. I mean, I've explained how to create agents, create groups, create mailboxes, create filters, create rules, and the label, as well as building a workflow for two different groups, two different mailboxes, and an escalations workflow. I hope that you found this part of the webinar to be helpful. If you have any questions, please let me know. You can always reach support at desk.com with any questions that you might have and we'd be happy to help you. I'm going to switch back to Brian right now. All right, thanks so much, Bob. I uh, really appreciate sh uh, you sharing your expertise on this setup here. Uh, let me switch back to my screen here. Give me one second. All right, and as Bob was saying, um, if you ever do have further questions on Desk or if you need any further assistance, uh, you can always contact, contact us at support at desk.com. Uh, some other really great helpful resources are going to be the other webinars uh, in this series. Again, this is only one of five. We have uh, some other really great uh, exciting webinars uh, going on for the rest of this month. Um, and also, if you want to go ahead and uh, get a little bit ahead on your setup, feel free to visit uh, support at desk.com to find a lot of great uh, articles on uh, how to set up desk and also how to use desk. So uh, at this point, let's go ahead and field some questions. Uh, we got some during the webinar, but uh, feel free to uh, chat in any of your questions on the GoToWebinar questions panel. Uh, we'll go ahead and begin with a couple of these from the beginning. Uh, Bob, um, is there a limit to how many groups we can set up? There's not a known limit. Uh, there may be one, but it, whatever the group, whatever the limit is, is probably pretty high. It's probably higher than anybody's reached. I'm not aware of anyone ever hitting a limit. Okay, that then sounds like a lot then. Okay, great. Uh, another question we have here is uh, about Postmark. Uh, can we use both Postmark and my own email box that I set up? Yeah, actually in the example we used Postmark for the support email addresses as well as uh, the Gmail box for the sales email addresses. Uh, the other thing you can do with Postmark rather than sending directly to it is you can forward emails from any email address that you have to that mailbox and it'll come in. So you can receive emails whether through forwarding or directly to the email address you know, in case you want to keep your branding together or you can use your own mailbox. Okay, great. Uh, another question here, um, it says, uh, I have a rather large team, uh, so I'll probably need to create a lot of filters. Uh, how many filters can I set up? Uh, again, I don't think that there's an upper limit. I know that we have some teams that have like four or five pages of filters, which is probably in the 100 to, 100 to 150 range. I don't know of an upper limit, uh, but I do know that we have some that are using, you know, at least 100 filters. Okay, great. Uh, another question here, uh, can you explain more about keywords on filters and what that does? So yeah, so keywords in filters can search for um, specific keywords in a case. Um, you, can, you can use it, let's say you want to look for uh, cases that have the word Apple in it. Uh, you can search, you know, put the, put the keyword Apple in the keywords field and it'll search for cases that have the word Apple in it. Okay, great. Uh, if you, oh, so before, I'm before fine. You, sure, before you move on, if you, uh, when you're in the keywords section in the admin, when you're looking at the filter, there's a little help article there. That'll give you all the different advanced syntaxes and stuff like that that you can use in keywords. So you can use those. That'll be pretty helpful and that'll help explain what you can do with the keywords section. Okay, great. Uh, another question here, when you create a filter, does it enable by default? No, you have to actually hit the enable button. Okay, so so on every, on every filter that they create, they just have to click the actual enable button? Yeah, that goes for pretty much anything. So as far as creating filters, um, rules, labels, macros, um, I can't think of what else, but basically anything is going to be turned off by default. 
because we wanted to we wanted to give you a chance to take a look at what you've done before you actually flip it on. Sometimes you just you know you think something's a good idea and then you flip it on and then you realize it's not what you wanted and it confuses people. So uh, we give you a chance to think about what you just created and uh, make sure you want to turn it on. Okay, great. Uh, another question here. I think you did review this, but maybe you could revisit this. Can you explain the difference between an inbound and outbound interaction? Sure. So um, it's a great question. There's two types of interactions. One is an inbound and one is an outbound. And what an inbound interaction is is something that the customer sends into your desk site. So if, you, if a customer sends in a new email, that's an inbound interaction. Uh, when your agent replies to a case or replies to that email, uh, that's the outbound interaction. So it's basically, if you think about it, it's coming inbound to desk or co going outbound from desk. Okay, great. And it uh, looks like we have one more question here. Um, actually, two more. Sorry. Uh, where can I set my business hours? Uh, that's a great question. You can do that in the admin under settings in the upper right corner of the screen. Okay. And on that first page in site settings, you should be able to set your business hours. Okay. And it looks like we have one more here. Uh, what's the difference between a note and a reply? Does the customer see the note? That's another good question. So a note is uh, not seen by the customer. I mean, there's ways for you to make it do that, but you have to explicitly want to do that in your themes. And most people want notes to be internal only. So by default, they're internal only notes, which are seen from one agent to the next, where a reply is actually sent to the customer, and they see that in their thread. So uh, a customer does not see notes, uh, but you can customize your templates to make it so they do, but that's something that you would explicitly be doing. So it's not going to happen by accident. It's going to be something that you do on purpose if you want them to see the notes. In most cases, you don't want them seeing notes. Uh, I can't think of a good reason why you would uh, want them to see a note rather than just reply, but for the, for the most part, um, you know, notes are internal only. And it looks like we do have time for one more question. Um, and this is a looks like it's unrelated to kind of the topic today, but just a good question. Um, how can we send attachments uh, on replies? Yes. So in the agent screen, underneath the reply area, you'll see a little button that says uh, it'll, it'll it'll look like a uh, paperclip, and then you can send an attachment with it. Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks so much again, Bob, for kind of leading the session and kind of sharing your expertise with us. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, we'll, we will be sending out the recording later today. Uh, we'll also be posting it to our YouTube channel. Um, so again, thank you for joining, and we look forward to seeing you again on future webinars. Thank you, everyone.